Right. Uh, thanks, Wale. Um, today we have a treat. Uh, one of the things we try to do in the class is find new and interesting people to bring in. Uh, I first met uh, Alyssa Knight on an online innovation safari, and she was listed as this kid at 17 who was hacking into banks and other places. She got arrested. I may have misspoken. I don't know that she actually went to jail, but I do believe she was arrested for it. Um, and she was just cool and exciting. Uh, for me, one of the things I'm interested in learning from Alyssa today is the mindset of a hacker. Uh, since then, she's done a lot of hacking. She's done um, a security company, and she's moved on to do a lot of other things. Um, so she's got a really wide, diverse background. Um, and I think she's going to give us some perspective on how she's approached life in a very different way, uh, in an amazing way, and done some really interesting things. And so with that, I'd like to give a big round of applause to welcome Alyssa Knight. Thank you for coming. I'm sure you're all very busy. I'm Melissa Knight. Thank you very much. Have a great day. That was my presentation. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So when I was little, I wanted to climb. I wanted to climb everything. If there was something that I could climb, I wanted to climb it, and I climbed it. My parents would always tell me, no, you can't do that. You're going to hurt yourself. And I never understood why I couldn't do things. Why can't I? Because you said so? Well, I'm going to do it, and we'll see if you're right. It was a constant game of, it was a constant game of my parents telling me no, and me asking why. So, you know, I would, you're all too young to remember these, but CRT televisions, they were really big and heavy. And uh, I, would, I would climb up the entertainment system and jump off of it. And I never got hurt, so I never understood why my parents never wanted me to climb on things. And so, fast forward four years. When I was six, I wanted to climb trees big trees. So when I first started climbing trees, my first tree, I remember as if it was yesterday, it was like twice my size. It was, I was, you know, a little six-year-old, so, you know, it was like twice my height. And I climbed up that tree, nothing happened, okay? So some time went on, and I got really experienced at climbing trees, and really good at climbing trees. I would scale up the branches, and for those of you who are from the Pacific Northwest, I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. And um, in Seattle, we have these evergreen trees. And, and they can get quite large, they can get quite tall. So when I was six, there was a tree outside my parents' house that was taller than our house itself. It was a single-story house. And so this tree must have been around 50 feet right? It's pretty high for a six-year-old. And my parents didn't know. They were inside doing whatever parents do. And I started to climb this tree. And I remember climbing all the way up and being so proud of myself. I was climbing branch by branch by branch. And I was so high, I could see all of Seattle, it felt like. And I kept climbing and I kept climbing. And then I fell out of it. I fell out of this 50-foot tree, and I was so high up, and I was thinking as I was falling down, man, my mom's going to be mad at me. And I kept falling, and I broke every branch as I was falling down, and I grabbed on branches as I was falling. And I was thinking, you know, man, this hurts. <laughs> this hurts a lot. And so I kept falling, and I kept falling, and it felt like I was falling forever. It felt like I was falling forever. And I finally hit the ground, right? And I was thinking, oh my God, oh my God, I had to pretend. It was like in the Christmas story, right? Pretend that I didn't just shoot my eye out. <laughs> I, just, I just got back up and I hope nothing was broken and I just uh, 
I just kept going. I went inside and I pretended nothing was wrong. I was scraped up. I had cuts and bruises. And I didn't break anything. And I, I, I was okay. I didn't die, right? But for the first time in my life, at six years old, I truly felt alive. I felt like I could do anything. I, here I was scaling this 50-foot high tree, and I could do it all, and, and I survived. And that means I'm invincible. I could do anything, especially if people told me no. <laughs> I could break all the rules, and I would be okay. That was my takeaway from this, but something happens. Something broke that day that weren't bones. I broke my fear. I got up that day when I was six with no broken bones, but I didn't realize at that time, subconsciously, I now had a broken fear bone. And I was no longer afraid of doing anything. And at six years old, <laughs> at six years old, that's, that's pretty wild to think about, right? Not only that, but pretty dangerous, right? So all of a sudden, I wasn't afraid of doing anything. And, you know, I could leap tall buildings. And, and there would be no repercussions. No matter what the rules were, especially if I was told no, those rules didn't apply to me. Fast forward seven years. For those of you who remember payphones, um, I got involved in what was called internet relay chat. For those of you who remember AOL chat, internet relay chat was this massive network of online chat rooms where you could meet people, meet predators, <laughs> but meet people. And I got introduced to my first hacker. And I was 13 years old. And remember, now I have no fear. And I, I'm, I'm invincible at this point, right? Nothing could hurt me, nothing could touch me, and no rules applied to me. So I decided, I'm going to be a hacker. So at 13 years old, I started to hack. And at the time, for those of you who are familiar with the term phone freaking, it's a concept of hacking phone networks. So I would create, I would go to Radio Shack when they existed, and I would build these things called banana boxes, red boxes, blue boxes, black boxes. What they would do, I'd, for $5 of parts at Radio Shack, I would build these little boxes that would let me make free international phone calls. And then I got into car, what was called carding, where I would generate my own credit card numbers. And I would generate my own phone numbers, my own phone cards. And, man, I was, I was having a good time. I was like, I could hack anything. Oh, my God, there was this heroin. Not that I've ever done heroin. But there was this, but I had this heroin running through me. And I was, I was addicted. I was, a, I was addicted. It was an addiction. It was my crack. It was my meth. And I wanted more of it. And, and I could imagine at 13 years old, you could hack anything. Like, you're God. And I was like, oh my God, I, I got to do something bigger and better. I got to do something more. So I did. This is the chapter of my life, autobiography coming soon. This is a chapter of my life I like to call Dancing with the Devil. This was where I decided that fast food restaurant chains just weren't enough for me. I was way too superior of an intellect for fast food chains. I need to move on to the government because they're stashing aliens in Area 51 and I need to know. So that's what I did and <laughs> don't do this, but I decided it would be a good idea to use the computers at school to do this. Because you know, there's no attribution if I hack from school. So that's what I did. I would come in before everyone would show up at school, and I would stay until everyone left, and I would use the network, the computer lab, to hack the government. And uh, of, course, 
course they caught me. Uh, I, was, I remember I was going to school one day. It just felt weird because, you know, I hadn't had my head flushed in the toilet yet. And uh, I hadn't been bullied. It was calm, like this room, quiet. And it was weird because, you know, people were all kind of just staring at me, kind of like what you guys are doing right now. And I walked in and I was thinking to myself, something's off. Something's off. Um, I wasn't very popular in school, as I'm sure you can imagine. I was bullied a lot. But all I remember was stopping dead in my tracks because there were federal agents running towards me. And uh, I was like, oh my God. And uh, I, everyone was like all crowding around as if they were in on it and they were watching and people had their cameras out, their phones out. I think it was flip phone time, so they had their flip phones out. And uh, yeah, I'm that old, I'm 44. I'm not old, this is purple hair color. Um, so everyone was taking shots and I was being arrested. And I started crying. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I did it, I did it all. And um, they took me into the back and they interrogated me. That was scary, right? I'd only seen this on television. This was spooky, right? And uh, he was mean. Like, he was mad and mean. And you have to understand, this was the 1990s. So, like, it was the whole computer fraud and abuse act thing. There wasn't ransomware like there is today. There weren't ransomware crime syndicates. You were just hacking for notoriety. You defaced websites. Rafa was here. My hacker alias was Loki. God of mischief. And um, I was scared. And I realized that um, my dad was going to kill me. Now, now you have to understand, my father was a, he was a Bama boy. All right, he was southerner from back yonder and yeah, south right there. All right. So he grew up in Mobile, so his form of punishment was a belt. My dad looked at me and he chuckled. He looked at me, he's like, in the car right home, started laughing. And I said, what, what's so funny? He's kind of serial killer-y. It was like kind of creepy. And uh, he said... You know, some parents pick their kids up from prison because of drugs or killing someone or whatever. I picked you up because you hacked a government network. That's kind of cool. So I was like, oh man, maybe I'm not dead after all. So it was, it was a big deal. And now the one thing was I got let off on a technicality. You guys all have to remember, guys and girls, you have to remember that I was two weeks from graduation. I was a few weeks from turning 18. They interrogated a minor without my parents there. District attorney didn't want to touch that. So I got off on a technicality. And I looked at this as an opportunity to reinvent myself. The dude on the left was me, and that's me on the right. So. From a very young age, I had realized that something was wrong with my body and couldn't understand why other girls' bodies were different than mine. And at the time, there was no Google. The idea or, or term of gender dysphoria didn't really exist, and I just figured I was gay. But I liked women, so it didn't make sense. So um, time went on, and I transitioned. Uh, in 2008, at the age of 27, into a woman. And so, you know, here I was breaking the rules again, right? The gender norms, the, the societal rules of what we're supposed to be, the boxes that we're supposed to be in. And, and I didn't want to conform as a hacker. I, I, I didn't want to be what the skin that I was born in. And so, here I was with my second chance, and 9-11 uh, happened, and planes got flown into the Trade Center, and um, Al-Qaeda had threatened cyber attacks against the United States. They ran an intranet called Obelisk. 
a lot of people think terrorists are just cave dwellers who aren't sophisticated. Oh, they're sophisticated. As a matter of fact, they were using child pornography to, to communicate with each other um, through what's called steganography. And so Al-Qaeda had this internet called Obelisk. And I went on Fox News Live to talk about it. And uh, immediately, almost immediately getting out of the Fox News offices, there was a van waiting for me. And I got picked up by the US intelligence community. And then I went to close quarter combat training. I was the first woman to go to their survival, evasion, resistance, and escape, or SEER training. Trained as a close quarter combat CQC, CQB sniper and traded in my keyboard as a hacker for an M4 and an AR-15. My area of responsibility was the Middle East and Africa. I supported the counterinsurgency advisory and assistance teams, or CATS, in Afghanistan, and the counter IED contract in Iraq. And I couldn't get away from that feeling of just continuing to want to hack and break things and tear things apart because I believed that could be made by humans, could be broken by humans. It didn't matter until computers could make themselves, until software could write itself, chat GPT, uh, it was always going to be flawed because humans are flawed. We're flawed and we will forever be flawed and we will always make mistakes. So I, I had a hunger and desire to chase that. So I started my first company in, when I was 17 years old, and I sold it to a public company when I was 20 for about three and a half million dollars, a small amount. And then I started my second startup when I was 24, and I sold it to a public company when I was 27 uh, for about five million dollars. And I'm in the middle of a $10 million exit on my current one. So I was what's called a serial entrepreneur. I wanted to continuously build and sell companies. I wanted to build things and sell it off. Very pretty woman and Richard Gere and pretty woman, right? So I, but I wanted to build and sell. And so in 2008, I retired and became a fashion photographer. That's a long story, probably for another day. But I, I retired and this is when things started to change because I decided in my retirement that I was not done hacking and I was not done breaking things. So that's what I did. I got brought out to Germany by a small startup company called Mercedes-Benz to hack into connected cars. That was a joke, you can laugh. Um, to hack connected cars. And I figured out how to take remote control of any vehicle on the road as long as you knew the VIN number. And I published a book on it called Hacking Connected Cards. You can go buy a copy on Amazon. I'll sign it. Um, so I, I, I became this first sort of connected car hacker. But it actually ended up earning me a contract with them. And I moved to Germany, Stuttgart. And I started hacking cars. See, here's the thing. People think that just because they're not driving around in a Tesla, they're impervious to being hacked. That's not true. Any car made after 2001 is connected over what's called OTA or over the air updates, over APIs. Yes, you're late. We see you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh my God, she's going to cry. She's going to cry. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We love you. We all love you. We all love you. Sorry. Sorry. You are so red. I'm so sorry. I'll give you a free copy of my book. Um, okay, so, so uh, <laughs> let's do it. Next person who walks in late, let's roast them. Um, so, you know, uh, it was, so I ended up presenting to like the FBI, CIA, DOD, uh, everyone explaining how I did this and how it was possible. And it took them a while. They, I think they finally fixed some of it. And um, this was, Beginning to, this was the beginning of my legacy that I was leave, le leaving, right? So after this, fast healthcare interoperability resources, or FIRE, let's say you break your arm. You look like a jock, a football player. Um, you break your arm jocking, whatever jocks do. You were jocking. And um, he was jocking, and he goes to a hospital, and he gets his arm fixed. And then he's like, well, that hospital sucks because they don't give out free candy. I want candy. So he goes to a different hospital 
and he gets himself worked on. He needs to fix his jockey arm. And the hospital doesn't know who he is. What's your name? Ryan? Okay, Ryan. You look like you're Ryan. Um, Ryan is like at this new hospital, and they're like, who the hell are you? What's, what's wrong with you? You got COVID? What's, what's the issue? He's like, no, I have a broken arm. Don't you have my records? Well, the hospital's like, no. What do you think this is, 2023? So, you know, he, the hospital has to get his records. So there's this problem in the United States, as a matter of fact, globally, that hospitals don't share information. It's the weirdest thing. Have you ever been, like, have you ever been asked by your doctor? It's like 2023, your doctor's like, can you have your other doctor fax your records? Fax. It's still a thing. So the Congress, got the government in their infinite wisdom, said, we need to fix this. We're going to mandate, we're going to require all healthcare providers and payers to share your healthcare info and make it available through APIs because we're the government, we can make you do it. And if you don't do it, we're going to penalize you by fining you and applying all kinds of bad stuff. And so payers and providers need to do this through Fire APIs. And I was thinking as a hacker, man, this doesn't sound secure. This doesn't sound good. Because the government, as we all know, is famous for their security. And I was like, well, let's see if we can hack this. So I ended up hacking it, got access to hundreds of millions of patient records of US citizens, and got a contact from the Office of Inspector General and Congress, uh, Health and Human Services, saying, um, you broke our stuff and we want to know why. And we want to know how you did it. And then I saw two congressmen on, Con on Capitol Hill hold up my report called Playing With Fire. You can all download it for free. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, that talks about how all of our healthcare data is available to be stolen. And um, there really is no such thing as privacy anymore. Um, that's another debate. So uh, I was now affecting policy, public policy. And so these congressmen are, I'm so sorry. I'm like, I'm moving a lot. So the cameraman's ready to kill me. Um, but the Congress was like, look, we're going we're gonna to do stuff with the laws because of your thing. We don't understand it. But we're going to do stuff with laws. And that's, that's pretty cool because we're going to say it was you. And so that was, that was what I did. And then I decided that, well, I'm just not done yet. You know, I'm, I'm 43, 44, turning 44, and I just, I'm not ready to retire. So let's go after the banking system. And then I was like, well, you know, what's this whole crypto thing? You know, Bitcoin and all that. I need some Bitcoin. I need me some Bitcoin. Ryan, give me some Bitcoin. And uh, I was like, let's go after the Bitcoin. So I decided to target our financial infrastructure because here's the thing, folks. Banks actually don't keep money anymore, by the way. It's all ones and zeros. So I decided to task myself with a challenge. Instead of climbing a tree, I was going to hack 55 banks in less than a week. And I decided that that was something I would do. And many, many shots of tequila later. This better be a bathroom break, mister. Mike, you look like a Mike. Mike is it? Okay, so, <laughs> no one's free. So, um, what was I talking about? What was I saying? Okay, banks, crypto, right. So, so I'm like, I need me some crypto. So I started targeting 55 banks, including cryptocurrency exchanges, and was able to relieve these banks and these cryptocurrency exchanges one of whom happens to not exist today. Starts with an F, ends with TX. But I promise not to say their name, just that they start with an F and ends in TX. And a lot of these other Binance and all these other ones that I found holes in, I was able to relieve account holders of their big one. Because you have to remember, we're not really exchanging paper money anymore. It's all Apple credit cards, you know, Apple Pay, Google Pay. It's all Bitcoin. It's all ones and zeros. So you could actually hack. I wanted to prove in my new series, Princess of Thieves, new book coming out, by the way, 
uh, Princess of Thieves that I could actually rob banks from my living room in my pajamas. And I did this for a week, and I successfully robbed 55 banks. And so they were, of course, working with me on it. It's not like I'm up here to make anything illegal. Or am I? But I was ready to now retire. And so I did. So after two decades, 23 years, uh, I was ready to become a Hollywood producer. I know, you're probably thinking, what? <laughs> what? What do you, what? Like, okay, tree climber to serial entrepreneur to hacker to producer? Yeah, so my wife and I, Mel, who's here, hi honey, um, we, uh, we own a group of companies um, called Night Group. And it owns a coffee company. Yes, we own a coffee company, roastery and coffee bean reserves in Seattle. Go pick up your bag on Amazon, Night Coffee. Um, and we also own Night Studios, which is a film, movie, and TV production company. We've produced five TV series so far. Uh, I'm the director. And we also own an events company where we put on annual conferences. We also own um, a digital marketing agency. So, you know, I kind of have to be, I'm the ADD poster child. I kind of have to be doing a lot of stuff. And uh, that comes full circle with don't be afraid to climb trees. My whole life has really been affected and really the pivotal point, right, was falling out of this tree for me. It was realizing that, you know, innovation, whether it was a new product I was developing at Applied Watch and NetStream or a, a TV series, all of that had shelf lives. All of that has a shelf life, right? Where it started was with me. And where it started, as far as whether or not I did those things, was fear. And for me, I left my fear on the ground that day, and it shaped the rest of my life. Now, please don't go on Twitter or X, sorry, and say that Alyssa told me to jump out of a tree. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the difference between actually failing and succeeding in life is not whether or not you fall, it's whether or not you get back up. That day I got back up. And I'm here to tell you that the only reason I've been able to sell, start and sell three companies, hack 55 banks in a week, and do the things that I've done is simply just because I wasn't afraid to do it. And to me, at the end of the day, that's all life really is about, right? It's all life is. There's, there's no secret sauce to life. There's no secret source code. Life to me is nothing more than decisions and outcomes. Do you cheat on your boyfriend? Do you cheat on your girlfriend? Do you, do you hack into this government network? Do you hack into McDonald's? Do you start this company? Do you start this product? It's all decisions. And the outcomes from those decisions that shape me. This is not an evil QR code, I promise. This is actually my cell phone, so if you would like to stalk me, you can. Uh, take a picture of this QR code. It will take you to my mobile phone number, as well as my email addresses and social media. You survived my presentation. Thank you so much. It was a true honor to be here. Um, I'm a high school dropout, <laughs> so my mom never got to see me graduate high school, so this is a big treat for her to see me actually teaching at Harvard. And uh, I'll quote my favorite movie, once you teach at Harvard, it's all downhill from here, boy. Thank you very much. We are gonna switch over to a student panel. If we could have the panelists come on up. I think Wally will help me here with the, uh, the chairs. Thank you very much. So while we're setting up, and you're still mic'd, the question I wanted to get answered is, what is the mindset of a hacker? And how is that different than, I, I'll say it, a normal mindset? So to me, hacking is nothing more than delivering stimulus to an application that the developer didn't expect to receive. That's all hacking is. Any of you could do it. A lot of you are 10 times smarter than me. 
If I can do it, you can do it. So to me, hacking is really nothing more than that. It's, it's, it's understanding that can be made by humans, can be broken by humans, and there's a whole. To me, hacking is really nothing more than that. It's finding what the developer didn't expect you to do and then doing that thing and seeing what it does for you. Cool. We'll have a separate class on hacking uh, <laughs> later on this oh, semester. Thank you. I'm going to hand it over to the panel just to real quick. If you were a speaker ambassador, we've messaged you in Slack. If you could just check your Slack, that would be fantastic. And I'll hand it over. If you guys could introduce yourselves on the panel and then take it away. Hi, my name is Wesley. I'm a sophomore here, and I'm interested in filmmaking, so that's why I, I oh, wanted awesome. to be on this panel. Um, nice yeah. to meet you. Hi, I'm Charlotte. I'm also a sophomore. Hi, Charlotte. Yeah, it's great to meet you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Isabella. I'm also a sophomore and interested in technology. Nice to meet you. Cool. Nice to meet all of you. <laughs> um, well, thank you for I'm coming. I'm Melissa, here. by the way. <laughs> um, the first question I'd like to ask is, um, your journey from hacking to entrepreneurship is, is really fascinating. Could you elaborate on what skills or mentality you use during your unconventional background to innovate in the cy cybersecurity and entertainment industries? Um, I, I feel like it's curiosity. You know, I, I feel like the, my ultimate goal my entire life has been just being curious. And so the same thing that led me to hacking all of the things I hacked, knowing that it could be broken, um, the same thing led me in the entertainment industry as a director and, and producer is, is, you know, just just satisfying that curiosity to learn. You all have to understand something. I don't see myself as a master of anything. I see myself as a student. I'm forever learning and I'm forever curious and I will continue to learn until the day I die and, and will continue to be driven by that curiosity because what, you have to have curiosity to want to learn, right? You have to be curious about something in order to sit down and read that 300 page book. So I think the answer to your question is curiosity. Awesome, thank you. Do you think, um, and I know a lot of your movies are about hacking, do you think you are still curious about that field although you know so much and see yourself as a student? Um, no, I feel like, I feel like basically in cybersecurity I went as far as I could go and, and, and you know, cybersecurity and I have this sort of love-hate relationship and um, I feel like after 23 years, I, I was no longer really learning anything new. I really didn't, that curiosity had kind of died out, right? So I, I was like, I, I need to be curious about something new. And, you know, I've always wanted to, you know, my, my greatest memories growing up, my, happy, my happiest memories were going to the movie theater, right? They were going to watch films and, and, and binge watch TV series. And I wanted to tell stories. I wanted to be a storyteller. I wanted to make movies. I wanted to make TV shows. And so I decided that if Quentin Tarantino could do it, then, then I could do it, right? Like, he worked at a, v a video rental store. He didn't go to film class. University of YouTube, right? I didn't go to film school. I learned everything I needed to learn about directing and producing movies and TV shows on YouTube. And so, you know, it's, I don't know, it's, it's yeah, the, the curiosity kind of is gone in cyber for me, and now that's really been replaced by my desire to make movies. And talking about hacking, you said that it kind of your interest died out, so I think that would have happened eventually if you weren't caught, but how far do you think you would have gone if you were never caught? How much you know, you be hacking? I feel like I feel like the two things really weren't related, you know? Like, even though I was caught, even though I was arrested, it, you know, it was scary, but at the same time, it really, if you think about it, is what ignited my career in cyber. I, I, I knew that I could be paid and paid very well as a hacker that was working for the companies that I was hacking into. Um, you know, I, by the time I left, I was making about 385,000 a year. Um, my first job when I was 19, I was making 165,000 a year. So I was, I was paid really well, you know? Um, so it, I, I wouldn't say that it kind of stifled it or, or affected the curiosity in any way. I would say that, that what happened was 
whether I was arrested or not, much to your point, the curiosity would have still died out. I, I have to be constantly like, come on, like, you, I'm sure some of you can raise your hand and agree. Don't you love learning new things? Doesn't it? Like, like have you ever sat there and like, God, I'm bored. I'm, I'm bored. I don't want to learn this stuff. Dude, I was, I was an F student in school. Like, I don't know if I'm supposed to be saying that, but like, especially at Harvard. But I was, I was an F student, man. My parents celebrated when I brought home a D. Like, I was the dumbest kid in class. But, the, but it wasn't the fact that, that I, I just was stupid. It was that I wasn't interested in it. I, I didn't care. Like, I didn't care about biology or chemistry because I knew what I wanted to do. And I guess that was hack stuff. But, you know, I mean, it's, but yeah, I'm rambling. But did that answer your question? Yeah. It's, yeah, like, eventually the curiosity would have died out. Um, but, you know, it's always looking for that next thing that will, I mean, look, I'm, I'm running a coffee company. How the hell do you roast coffee beans? I don't, I don't know. To do, but I wanted to learn, and I wanted to do that, and I wanted to open coffee shops, and, you know, I, it's, it's weird. I just, I have to constantly, here, you know what it is? You know what it is? I, I want, when I die, I want all of you to be able to get around and say, she lived well. She lived well. I want to be able to live as many lifetimes in this one life that I've got as I can. I don't want to just be a hacker. I don't want to just be a producer. I want to, I want to be a coffee kind of I want to be, I want to have vineyards. I want to, I want to open a winery. I want to, I want to do all these things because I'm pretty sure I'm not going to get another chance at this life. This is sort of a follow-up based on that, but do you see overlaps between your different interests and do you seek to bridge those areas or do you see them more as, as distinct? Ooh, this is, good, are you, is this chat GPD? These are really good <laughs> questions. Like what? Um, okay, so overlap, yes. Um, so here's the thing. Um, it's in like mid-career, like mid to late career, uh, I started keynoting at hacker conferences. For those of you who are familiar with DEF CON and black hat briefings, like every year hackers descend or ascend on um, uh, Las Vegas every year for a hacker conference. And I started keynoting at these big conferences. And, and, and what I noticed about being on stage, and some of you probably noticed that here today, was if you notice, I, I, I was kind of storytelling, right? I was like telling a story. That's the thing is like, and that's what Steve Jobs got so well, is that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Did you all know that, the, that Apple actually didn't come out with the first iPod? It was Creative Labs. The only reason that we're not all walking around with a Creative Labs MP3 player in our pockets is because Apple told us why we needed it, and Creative Labs told us what it did. People love stories. And so even when I was hacking, when I would write papers about the vulnerabilities and the banks I would hack into and, and the cars I would hack, I was telling stories. And so in, in Hollywood now, I'm telling stories. Um, I'm just telling them more visually. Um, and one of the things that I learned on, on, in Hollywood was, you know, you, you really, as a director, you have to be a jack of all trades or Jane of all trades. So, cause I, my sound mixer quit the day before our production and, and like, this was a thing. So I had to learn how to be a sound mixer. And then, um, sorry, am I, I'm like talking too much. I'm sorry. Tell me to shut up. Like, so, you know, I, you have to like learn all of these things. I, I need to learn how to be a director of photography, a cinematographer. I need to learn how to be a gaffer. I needed to learn how to be a grip. I needed to learn how to paint with light. I needed to learn all of these things, which very much overlapped my curiosity and wanting to learn new things and hacking. What's next for you? Do you have something that you're... Oh, man. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a loaded question. I don't... What is next? I think my wife is like, there better not be anything next. Like, I'm done. Um, now, you know, um, I've, I've always wanted to have a winery. I think, I think the next one is a, a vineyard in Napa and, and, and you know, getting into wine, wine making. Yeah, it's weird, but yeah. 
You've talked about like a lot of cybersecurity and how you're hacking into these big companies that seem so much bigger than like all of us here today. What do you think that the average person, like not necessarily part of the government or anything, should be concerned about their safety in terms of hackers or cybersecurity, or like how does that affect us? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, look, the fact of the matter is, is that the world is way different today than it was like 10 years ago, right? If you think about it, CRT televisions, like that was a pretty recent thing. Like er technology is developing and evolving so fast. And a lot of the times what I learned as a hacker is that humans innovate before we secure. And so we want to create, and that's the, the amazing thing about being human is that we want to constantly create and innovate and build. And, and I love that about the human race. And the thing is, is that we, but security is an afterthought. And so, I, to be honest with you, I think the thing we need to be most concerned about is the level of connectivity of things that weren't previously connected. Like, it would scare you if you saw me what I could do with a car and a laptop. Like, it's crazy. Like, you guys would be walking. You guys and girls would be walking the rest of your life. Um, but here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. Um, it, you can't stop living, right? Like, I'm, I'm a hacker, my wife's a hacker, we, we live in a fully connected house. Like, I can remotely shut off my water from here. Um, like, everything is connected, everything's connect, uh, controlled by Alexa. And, and so, even though I'm a hacker, um, I, I want to enjoy the connectivity and the technology that we have today. Because we live in an, an amazing time. We live in a really awesome time. Like. Did you all know, I probably shouldn't say this, David's probably going to be really angry at me, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, you could even tell, you know, AI, ChatGPT or Bard, like, go read all of my white papers from the last 20 years and then write a new white paper based on the way I write. Like, that's a thing. Like, it's crazy. And so instead of writing in the tone of an AI, generative AI engine, it will write in the tone of me. And it, I swear to God, it looks like a paper that I wrote. So, I, I mean, look, there, there's a lot of danger with innovation. There's a lot of danger with, with connectivity. But I think it's all about risk management, right? I'm not, I don't think all of you should just empty your bank accounts and keep your money underneath your, your mattress. But, you know, the good news is that infrastructure, especially critical infrastructure, our banking system, our healthcare system, they have things in place to be able to recover and be able to restore and refund uh, when things like that happen. I will tell you that I don't, and some of you may want to key my car for saying this, I, I think you're all living in a fairy tale if you think we have privacy today. We, we really don't. I, I mean, like, I could go online right now in certain marketplaces and buy your info, Ryan. <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 you know, it's just your, your patient health records are out there your credit, I, it's, it's insane. Like, there is no privacy. I think it's great if you think you, you have privacy. Um, maybe you do with your diary if you're writing it on a piece of paper. But I just don't think, I feel like privacy is an illusion. I feel like my, I have a 19-year-old kid. Um, I, I don't think when he grows up, there's, I think privacy is going to be one of those things we all tell each other as legends of, of, of things that, that we used to have. So I just don't think it exists anymore. And Sorry to get all dark on you. I got, so, I got so dark on you. You're like, oh, God, I want to go slit my wrist now. I'm um, sorry. Go ahead. And if you could go back to when you were, like, around our age, or you said that you have a child around our age as well, like, what advice would you tell yourself? What do you wish you knew? Oh, God, what would I tell young Alyssa? Um, transition sooner. <laughs> I, I would have told myself to transition sooner. Um, I... Uh, I transitioned because a young girl threw herself in front of a truck uh, because her parents um, didn't approve of her being transgendered, so she killed herself. And um, I really kind of never wanted to be the one to wave that flag. Like, I'm trans, and you have to feel sorry for me, and this is what I deal with on a daily basis. I felt like there was enough of that on Twitter. I felt like there was enough of that on Facebook. And so I didn't want to kind of be the one to be like, I'm trans, I'm here, I'm queer. It wasn't that. But what happened was that when that girl, when that young lady killed herself, um, I realized that I had a responsibility 
to talk about the fact that I'm trans. I didn't have to talk about how hard it was or you know, the things that have happened to me being trans, but I could at least talk about it and say like, look, I started and sold multiple companies, I'm trans. I've hacked into these companies and I make this much, I'm trans. But I, I, I didn't want to just be a beautiful trans woman, I wanted to be a beautiful woman, right? I didn't want that to kind of be that little italic, you know? Um, so I would probably have come out being trans a lot sooner. Um, what would I tell my son? Climb your tree. Same thing I would tell all of you. Climb your tree and, and don't be afraid to fall because uh, you will live your best life having done that. All right, awesome. So you guys aren't relieved yet. So we have time left, so we're going we're gonna to have some fun here. So Charlotte. What is one thing you're not doing because you're trying to get straight A's at Harvard? Me? Um, yep, you. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I feel like I've been taking advantage of the experience to the best I to the best I can. Is I don't know any... if I have anything that I'm I'm not doing because I'm here. Okay. I try to prioritize if there's something that I really want to do, doing it regardless of my Wesley. Sorry. Asking your neighbor. I, I think so, too. Um, I don't know. I think Harvard kind of, it, it allows us to, to do more than, than just grades, and I think it cultivates that environment pretty well. How do you have any time with all the heavy work in this class? Uh, <laughs> oh, it's been rough. Why are you here. laughing? All right, our final panelist, same question. Is there anything you're not doing? I feel like, I, I don't know. I feel like I would explore more and try to, like, work on more startups or ideas and kind of dive down into that instead of like studying for tests or things like that. Yeah, I just, that's something that just really touched me is I've not done many things because it might jeopardize my time to do the thing that was certain, but all the richness that I've gotten out of life have come from doing those new things. And we had a panel many years ago and one of the students looked out at you all and said, God, your parents are paying for you for four years. This is the time to start your company. Don't go to class. Experience everything. You know, take all the risks you can because your parents aren't going to pay for it after you leave. I thought that was kind of an interesting perspective. Um, I want to open up for Q&A, but I want to do reverse Q&A here for a second. So, Alyssa, what questions might you have for our class? Oh, my God. I've got so... We would be here all day. All right. Um, well, 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 look... We're going to end before 11.45. By the way, Wally, if you want to get the QR code up while we're, we're having our Q&A here, that'd be great. What, what's one question you have? Who loves with honors? I mean, Brendan Fraser? I mean, I, I think... No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, what's it like to be, a, 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 like, young today? Like, what's... I, it just feels weird to, you know, be... I don't know, like, I don't know how you do it. Like, I, I would not be able to handle being your age in today's world. Um, you know, for me, bullying was, you know, being shoved in my locker um, and, and having my, my head flushed in the toilet. Like, bullying today is online. And I mean, like, what's it like to be a kid today? Anybody want to take a stab at that uh, very defined? Young adult, well, sorry. Your uh, question here. Got her guess really? Here. No one wants to take that question? Is it, I mean, like, uh, pressures? Is it like, I mean, the pressure has to be enormous being a Harvard student. Oh, my God. Like, that's more pressure the, than... Ooh, we got some excitement. NASA. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to walk slowly, be defiant. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, God, Hi. I thought it was the girl that I attacked for coming in late. Okay, okay. sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I also came in a little late, but um, hi, thank you so much for being here. My name is Amy. I think in terms of being young today, the hardest thing is like this idea of comparison. We call yeah. it imposter syndrome here, but I think it's so big because you have social media, so you're not only comparing yourself to your peers, but you're comparing yourself to every other collegiate student mm. who can pop up on your timeline or every other person your age who's doing X, Y, and Z. And I think I also want to go back to the question about if you weren't trying to get an A right now, 
I was talking to my friend about taking this class. She's right there. Her name's Dalen. Oh. And I was like, I really want to take con law, but I heard it's a hard class. And she convinced me to take it because she was like, what's your purpose for being here? Are you trying to learn? Are you trying to get A's? And I feel like there's so many things that we don't do because society has told you in order to be a good student, in order to be someone who's achieving well, you have to look like X, Y, and Z. So it's like, I want to learn to code. I would never take CS50. Oh. I'm trying to get that GPA right. Oh, um, I but, applaud you. That's, that's great. I, I can understand. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, who doesn't want to go to Harvard and say that they made straight A's? I don't think I've ever made an A. I think I made an A in PE once. But, I mean, like, I, I uh, yeah, that's enormous pressure, and I get it. And, you know, I, I know, like, it, it dawned on me how different of a time we live in now when um, I had hired the salesperson, and he said that one of the things that he does when his daughter throws a sleepover thing, um, that everyone has to check their cell phone in at the door. And I said, well, why, why do you do that? You have to remember, I didn't grow up with cell phones, right? We had beepers, right? We were so excited about beepers. And um, everyone checked their phone in at the door. And I asked, why, Eric, did, did they do that? And he said, well, because we don't want people taking pictures of having fun at this party because of all of her friends and everyone else who didn't get invited are going to feel bad. I was like, oh, wow. That's, that's, I never thought of that. That's, I mean... Wow. You know, I mean, it reminded me of just kind of how different things were, because if you got your feelings hurt back when I was a guy, like, you got your feelings hurt, it didn't matter. Like, you, you know, uh, you dealt with it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very different time, and I can understand that, that pressure to want to be, you know, just as good as your peers. And the, the thing is, is that I guess my only response to that, or if, I'm, if you even care to hear what my response is to that, but I mean, my response is, I, I just remember that what you see online isn't real, right? Like, don't, when... When, have you ever noticed that, like, how YouTubers, like, they'll record, them, uh, they'll record themselves waking up, and she's all, like, got her perfect makeup and her perfect hair, and she's like, oh, oh it's, it's, it's a great morning, and I look beautiful, and it's, it's just all so fake, and, and, and so just remember that, that what you're comparing yourself to is something that they've put on Facebook or put on YouTube um, for you to see as her perfect life, and People never film their bad or hard moments, right? They never, they never talk about their D's or their F's at Harvard or, you know, um, so you're, you're kind of chasing a ghost, right? Gotcha. Do we have some questions for Alyssa? Hacking questions, life questions? Anything. Hacking Absolutely questions. anything. AMA. Now's your chance. Yep. Oh, there we go. <coughs> I love bagpipe music. Like, it's the weirdest thing. Like, bagpipe music. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Daylin. I'm a junior. And I was just wondering about your job as a fashion photographer. Oh, yes. You were paying attention. Um, so, yeah, so I shot for, um, for those of you who know who Jigsaw London and Black House, White House Black Market is, I shot for them. So I, I decided when I retired at 27 that, that I didn't want to just go fish on a lake. Um, so I started a fashion photography um, agency in San Francisco and um, did some amazing um, shoots. And I guess that's kind of really what influenced a lot of my work now as a, as a, a director in Hollywood is, um, you know, having been a photographer, fashion photographer. I love fashion photography, like, like couture fashion photography. I love it. Um, you know, it's, it's I guess a, a, the other thing that really drove me and, and was so enamored about, you know, being, living my life as a man and then living my life as a woman was that the, the woman's body, no matter what size she is, no matter what color she is, is beautiful. Like the, the female body is just so beautiful. And, and as a fashion photographer, I, you know, I didn't want to just shoot size zero women, you know, I, I wanted to shoot all sizes of women. And, and um, I, I just, I've always just, been in love with the with the female body, and so that's really what drove me to being a fashion photographer, and um, enjoyed it. I, I did it for quite a few years, and yeah, had a good time. Awesome. Do we have any other questions for Alyssa? Yes. Um, so you mentioned like Chad GPT earlier. Who are you? You oh, didn't hi. introduce yourself. Right. <laughs> My name is Tyg. Um, I'm a hi, graduate Ty. student. And <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna look out and say, like, that Alyssa is so rude. <laughs> she's, she's so mean. Sorry, no, guys. sorry, no, you're right. Um, but yeah, I wanted to ask you about, so you mentioned like, you know, using Chad GPT um, and your curiosity to hack into, you know, different types of organization. 
to me, it seems kind of like evident that if it doesn't already exist, it's going to be common that every type of company in the future is going to have some type of language model that they use making decisions for them. Is that a space that you've considered maybe hacking into next to sort of expose those vulnerabilities? It's kind of scary that you asked that question. So that's actually happening right now. So there's what's called, for those of you who are familiar with machine learning, um, there's what are called um, supervised and unsupervised learning models. And most of the machine learning models are, um, they learn by ingesting data, right? So garbage in equals to garbage out, right? So a model is only as good as the data that you train it with. Hackers figured out that you could actually retrain those machine learning models with what's called adversarial ML or adversarial AI. So you could be running a company and securing your network with AI, and then I find out that you're using machine learning models. I'll actually retrain your AI to not see me. So here's the thing. Um, AI is only as good as the people that created it. AI is only, again, back to the, you're going to hear me say this a lot, humans are the weakest link in security, plain and simple. It's just the fact. And so, you know, humans will make mistakes. And AI, if you make a mistake with AI, it will use those mistakes to train itself. And hackers realize this, which is why a lot of hackers are able to hack into things, even though a lot of the jobs have been replaced by AI, a lot of security analyst jobs. Like, when you guys graduate, I don't know what year you guys are all, um, but by the time you graduate, I guarantee you a lot of the jobs in cybersecurity have been replaced by AI because humans aren't trusted. We're not, we're not trusted anymore. We're, there's so much falling asleep at the wheel. Do you, you, did you guys know, guys and girls, did you know that, that Equifax, when it was hacked, when the big breach with Equifax, it, the security operations center was notified of it while it was happening, and they closed the alert as a false positive. Humans are the weakest link in security, and they forever will be. And so until we remove humans from the loop, which is what a lot of this effort is behind, is removing humans from the loop, we won't have that true security. For sure. Uh, all right. Uh, fantastic. Let's give a round of applause for Alyssa. <laughs> and for our amazing panel. Um, we're ending early today. If the speaker ambassadors could stop up and see me real quick. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Thank you.